Uh, we've been teaching from the book of Ephesians now for a couple of months. And we're t uh, we, just to recap as we conclude this, this teaching, um, Ephesians is primarily divided into two book or two thoughts. The first three chapters is the grace of God. Our key word was what for those first three chapters? Done. There you go. Thank you. Done. <clears throat> it's what Christ has done for us. Amen. And so Paul lays out, you know, and, and anytime you take Bible truth and you only take one aspect of it and you don't take the other scriptures that don't line up with your theology about something, you're going to get unbalanced. Amen. Biblical balance is the Bible balancing itself. Yes. And how does it balance itself? Well, you know, uh, some people say, all I got to have is faith. Well, you know, faith without love is dead being, uh, faith without love um, doesn't work because faith works by love. Amen. You got to have the love of God. But you know what? I mean, you can have love, but if you don't have uh, faith, you, you're not going to get anything done. There's, there's just, the Bible has a, has a um, it's a self-balancing book. And so Paul takes the book of Ephesians and in the first three chapters discusses the grace of God. You know, who we are, what we have in Christ, what it means to be in Christ, uh, what belongs to us, what he has done for us. Amen. And he turns right around in chapter 4 and says, you know, because you've got people who run out and, go, and hear something like that. They go, oh man, I don't have to do anything. It don't matter what I do. I'm under the grace of God. And then Paul turns right around in chapter 4 and says, walk ye therefore worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. What, 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 therefore, why is it therefore? Because of what he's done, walk worthy of it. Amen. Well, how do you walk worthy of it? Well, remember grace, not only, you know, the, the term grace uh, has many meanings to many people, but the one that the church has adopted almost single, singularly in thought is unmerited, undeserved favor, which really doesn't fit all the places the word grace is used in the Bible. Amen. It doesn't. When you start talking about, you know, uh, ministry grace, you know, empower for ministry, it doesn't mean God, un you were undeservedly, unmeritedly uh, favored for ministry. It means you were empowered for ministry. See, grace can mean empowerment, depending on how it's used. You're empowered to live a holy life by the grace of God, not undeserved. See, undeserved, unmerited favor doesn't make sense when you start talking about the, the grace of God uh, and calls you to live a holy life. No, it's an empowerment. So grace has more meaning than simply undeserved, unmerited favor. So Paul covers uh, what it means to be done in the first three chapters. Comes back in the fourth and through the sixth chapter and begins to talk about what we are to, what's the next key word? Do. do. Because of what he's done. Amen. And so we've covered that. And we've gone over things. And you know, and you just really got to be dishonest about biblical uh, interpretation to come along and say, it doesn't matter what I do. You know, nothing I do has any consequence. Nothing I do has any merit or, 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 or weight on how I do things or what God does or doesn't do for me. I mean, Ephesians 6, 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, for this is the first... Amen. The first what? Amen. I've had people tell me there's no commandments. Well, <laughs> Paul said this is the first. Now, if it's the first, there's others. He didn't say this is the only commandment. He said the first commandment with what? With promise. So in other words, the, the commandment with promise means there are conditions by which you obtain what it promises. Amen. See, for, for some people to tell us that, there are, that nothing I do bears any weight on the results of what God's going to do for me is dishonesty. Sells good tapes, sells good books, gets you television program, gets you on the talk shows, but it doesn't help people live their life the way they're supposed to live it. Right. And in the end, minister's job is to train and develop the believer so they can live a victorious life according to the Word of God and fulfill their destiny in the things of God according to the Word of God. And so, he said the first commandment we're promised, and here's the promise, that thou mayest, uh, uh, that thou mayest, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. So he says here that living long and having it well with you is contingent upon you honoring your father and mother. Come on now. now I'm under grace, it don't matter. Paul didn't say that. Right. And he quoted an Old Testament. This is one of the top ten, babe. This came out of the top ten. You know the Ten Commandments? Right, those things that, that, that Charlton Heston came off the mountain with in the, in the movie? It's a joke. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is one of the top ten. And he said, but it's the first one that had a, had a promise with it. In other words, there are, there are commandments. Now, this is just the first one we'd promise. There are commandments where to obey. There's no promise with them. You're supposed to do them. Oh, that went over good. Come on now. Hell, I'm going to mess up Bill's light here. 
<laughs> yeah. He just said it was the first commandment with promise. He didn't say it was the first commandment. He just first one that had a promise that went with it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Paul, you know, Jesus said, you think I've come to do away with the law? I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. Amen. There are principles in the Word of God. And so Ephesians chapters 3, 4, I mean 4, 5, and 6 begin to deal with what we are to do as a believer since, what, since Christ has done for us in his redemptive work. The empowerment does not come from obedience uh, from the flesh or from willpower. The empowerment comes from the grace of God. Amen. His grace empowers you to do the things that God's Word commands you to do. Amen. And so the thing, we thank God for His grace. We thank God for divine empowerment from heaven. We thank God that Jesus went and paid the price. I couldn't buy my way out of hell. I couldn't earn my way out of hell. I couldn't work my way out of hell. I had to have somebody come and pay the price for me, and Jesus did. Glory to God. And then he empowered me. Amen. 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 He empowered me to come into the kingdom through faith. Now, that's nothing. he didn't make me do it. He gave me the empowerment to do it. To the, look, hold your place right here. We're going to run back over. <laughs> I am going to finish Ephesians chapter 6 today. But go to John 1, the Gospel of John. If I can get out of Luke, I'll get to John. Listen to this. Now, there, there are teachings out there, and, and one of the things that we're, we're concerned about in the body of Christ is the move towards universalism. There are people teaching, you know, that, that God, God saved everybody, past, present, I mean, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, future, and once you're saved as a Christian, you can't, you can't lose your salvation, your sins are all covered, it doesn't matter what you do, yada, yada, yada. And they're only one step away from even the, uh, the sinner being saved, because they're all sins are forgiven, past, present, future. I mean, they're one step away from teaching that. Boom, one step over. And it'll come. Just, 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 you just watch. It'll be there. It'll, it'll start, it'll, there'll be a movement of, of universalism spreading the church. It's already hit, hit, well, I mean, like I said before, there's one church in Tulsa that was 5,000 members and totally lost the church because they got into universalism. 5,000, I mean, within a year, 5,000 people gone, lost their building and everything. Five, I mean, five grand, I mean, 5,000 people gone. That's a lot of people. And we're not talking about, you know, losing 20% or 10%. We're talking about losing 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? The grace of God is there, but you've still got to receive it. You've still got to act on what Jesus said. You know, be, becoming a believer, come, becoming into the kingdom of God, it is, um, it is believing, but there is one thing you must do in your believing to be a Christian. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God's ra that uh, God's raised Jesus from the dead. If, if you confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You still got to confess him. Amen. You can believe it, not confess it, and it won't do you any good. Because the Word says that we have to confess him as Lord. Amen. Now look here, look here in John chapter 1. I want to show you something real here. Verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own, and own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, now this is the, the word power is exousia and uh, authority or <coughs> right of privilege. But you know what? Notice what caused that power to be released to them to believe or to, to become a child of God. They received him. Amen. They chose to accept him or believe on his name, and he gave them the power. In other words, the grace of God was released in their behalf when they, when they made a decision to receive him, and that empowered them to receive, to receive and to become a child of God. Amen. You see? So things are done for us, but our faith is what releases it into our behalf or into our lives. Amen? It's there. You know, but if you don't act on it or don't receive it, it won't do you any good. Let's go back over to um, Ephesians. I was just making that point as we're kind of summarizing this teaching. 
So Paul, Paul lays out the, the case for the grace of God, what Jesus has done for us, that is an empowerment, that it, it, there, it, it, coming into the kingdom, there is a favor involved, and I understand that, but there really, there's empowerment behind the grace of God. And then in, in 4, 5, and 6, he begins to talk about, because you're under this empowerment, because you're under the grace of God, because of what Jesus has done, this is what you're supposed to go do. You're supposed to act this way. Amen. Amen? Don't, don't be writing stupid Facebook stuff. I, because I'm under grace, I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit. I don't have to pray. I, I can live with my girlfriend and fornicate. It's okay. Yeah. I said this before. I got a minister that, that, that I oversee. He had, a, he had a couple call him up on one day on the phone and say, we need help. Uh, we want to come in for counseling. All right, we got, we're having relationship problems. So they get into his office. He gets talking to them finds out they're living together. He says, well, don't you think maybe the fact that you're living together is why you're having relationship problems? They look and say, no, pastor, we're under grace. It don't matter. That's all taken care of. And they were serious. He said, well, uh, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to disagree with your position. You know, the, re the reason you're having problems is because you're living in sin. No, no, we're under grace. And they left the church. Well, I mean, you can't help people who, who are going to be dumb. <laughs> Hello? If you're going to be dumb, what are you going to have to be? Tough. Tough. If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to continue to have relationship problems if you're going to live with somebody and not get married. Yeah. Hello? Because there's no commitment to what you're, what you're, you're just, you're just wanting the benefits of a marriage without the responsibility and the commitment. Amen. Amen. That went over big. All right. So now we've gone through the armor of God, except we're, we're, we're down to about verse 18 or so. Um, so Paul spends all this whole chapter talking about the body. These, four, these three chapters talking about the body, talking about our role, talking about what we're to do as a believer. And then now he's going to summar, he's going he's to come, he's going to close out his letter. And he starts out uh, in verse 10 talking about, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then he goes into the armor of God. As a believer, you need to be fully equipped. Paul's laid out, Jesus has gone before you. Jesus has conquered the enemy. Jesus has, has released his grace in your behalf. And if you'll walk in according to the word, and you'll walk in the light of the word, then you're going to walk in a place of victory. You are not going to walk in a place of victory disobeying the written word of God. Now, I know the newest thing is that the Bible is not really God's word. It, uh, you know, that Jesus in you and the Holy Spirit in you is more than enough to cause you to live victoriously. I, mean, I had a discussion with a guy about this. He's, go, he's got churches all over uh, Africa and stuff, and he teaches this. And I'm telling you, stuff's all over the world, people. <clears throat> Yet Paul wrote clear instruction. <laughs> Amen? There's, and Paul and, and the other New Testament writers wrote clear instruction. If you want a life of victory, yes, we're under the grace of God. There is an empowerment from heaven to do right. Amen? Like, I think uh, Tony Cook, and he may, have, he may have gotten this from somebody else, but he, he said it this way. He said, um, he said, grace is not divine permission to do wrong. Grace is divine empowerment to do right. Amen. 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 It is a divine empowerment to live out the commands of the Word of God. Amen. And to do them, hallelujah, and please the Father, praise God. And to walk according to the Word. And to live that life of victory, praise God. Amen? Amen. Stop looking for a way to get out of doing the Bible and do everything you can to be doing the Bible. Hallelujah. Amen. And looking to the grace of God to empower you to do the things you know you can't do in your own ability. Amen. Hallelujah. When you know that it's not by might and not by power, but by the Spirit. Spirit of God, hallelujah. Look to that and say, you know what? i being a glutton is not something I should be doing. And the grace of God empowers me to control my flesh, to buffet my body, to put it under, to say no to that 15th piece of pie. Yeah. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> I know some folks read that and said, the Bible says to buffet my body daily, and I put my body under, and I go to every all-you-can-eat buffet every day. <laughs> That's not what we're after. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody tell me this, this water is amoeba-free, certified amoeba-free. Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. 
Sometimes I look up here and I wonder, how long has that water been up here? <laughs> Glory to God. The, the, the empowerment of God's grace in our life. So Paul tells us about that empowerment, and then he begins to tell you what to do with it. Walk worthy. You're part of the body of Christ. We're suppliers. We're supposed to be supplying the body. Yeah. Too many Christians, you know, and I understand Christians need to come to church and get fed and get ministered to, and, and, uh, and people need body ministry. We need to have body ministry. What does that mean? It usually means get together and everybody kind of laying hands on each other and having their own little place of ministry themselves. They're looking for a ministry within the ministry. No, if the body's doing what it's supposed to be doing, we are ministering to the body because every joint supplies. We shouldn't have to come up with a body ministry program. Hello. Where, you know, you, you see somebody hurting, you go love on them and hug on them, y'all sit back there and cry the whole service. I've had that happen before. They all sit around and cry, then leave the church. Hello. Or uh, your, your, your prophecy corner. Just prophecy corner. I'm going to come over and I'll prophesy. I'll give you my phone number and at 11 o'clock at night I'll have a word for you. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have a guy back in our church in Greenville. Um, and, and, he, and, and he, he, this lady would call him up and say, Brother John, I need a word. 11, 12, 3, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. She'd call him up because she wanted to have a word from Brother John. Yeah, good night. Go pray. <laughs> that, those clouds you saw on the side that said GP, meant go plow. Go pray. Go do, didn't say go preach. <laughs> But Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that the, every joint in the body supplieth. See, we're supposed to be coming as suppliers. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm hurting. The grace of God empowers you. The grace of God, you know, infuses you with his might. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm filled with the might of God. Amen. You got to look in the mirror and say that to yourself today. Yeah. Go home and get in your car. I mean, get in your car. You got a side mirror over there. Turn it in so you can see it. Turn the one over here in so you can see it. Put the rear view mirror up and drop down those, those vanity mirrors and just look at all of them and say, I got the might of God in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then fix them all so you don't have a wreck. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Paul begins, to, he goes through these chapters and talking and telling them how to live that life of victory because of what Jesus has done. This is not what worthy the vocation wherewith you're called out of your ability. This is what worthy the vocation wherewith you're called because the grace, the empowerment, the divine empowerment of God is upon your life. And you can walk worthy of that vocation wherewith you are called. Amen. Tells wives to submit their husbands. That takes the divine empowerment. Especially that knucklehead some of you guys are. I got, I, look, amen, I got an amen. How do, amen's all over the church. I mean, next time your husband looks at you and says, woman, submit, you go, thank God for his grace. I sure need it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. Mm-hmm. Husbands, love your wives, even when she's being ugly. Yeah, I said being ugly, not looking ugly. There's a difference. You, you guys go read three chapters ahead now and go back to the first one. Just see all the graces out there. You're going to need it before you get home. But he goes on, he just, he's, begin, begin, he's talking throughout these chapters about what we are to do. Right, how we're to live. Now, if you just jumped in there at chapter 4 and began to read without having read the first three chapters, you would think it was all done in the flesh. You'd come up with a bunch of rules. You'd think it was all done because, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. But you've got to go back, you've got to include both sides of everything and understand God's grace empowers you to live this way. God's grace is the empowerment by which and how you do these things that we talked about for the past month or so. Amen. Amen. And so Paul, he comes, and, and, and I find it interesting, verse 9, nine of this chapter says, Ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is there respect to persons with him. But before that, talk about the, the servants being, obeying their masters. Yeah. How can you do that, Grace. 
you know, there's, there's, there, there, is a, there is a legal system that's, 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 that's repressive, that's not good, it's bad, but people are getting saved, slaves and slave owners, and the grace of God empowers them to live within a system that's not good and still have victory. Amen. Amen. I said amen. Yeah, God, God, want, God wanted to change the system, but you know what? He's not going, you just can't have people live in defeat while you're waiting for the system to get changed. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Right now, and some of the economic things we're facing, and some of the things that are going on in our government, in our, in our court systems, and all the socialistic and Marxic, 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 Mar I can't get it right now. Marx, thank you, somebody get me saying. Marxist, I'm going to add an extra syllable in there, and I couldn't get rid of it. Marxist junk that's going on, you know, you can look at all the things that my God, we're in trouble, but you got to remember, you're under the grace of God. You're empowered to live victorious no matter what's going on there. Amen. 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 Thank God. Hallelujah. I am under the grace of God. I am empowered to live victoriously. And I'm empowered to do what God's Word says. Even I can still tithe and I can still give and I can still bless even in the economic downturn because I'm under the grace of God. I am empowered to prosper and I'm going to keep doing what God says do because I'm empowered to do so and His blessings are going to continue to flow. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, it, now, here's the other side of that thing where the lunatics get involved. I'm under grace. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to do these things. Isn't there, is there a difference between the two positions or two views? Well, you don't have to. But I can tell you, according to the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, <laughs> chapter 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 9, that man receives as he purposes and sows in his own heart. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. So if you want little, look, I mean, listen, if you want one tomato plant with four tomatoes this year, that's fine. You can have it. If you want none, you can have it. But don't come expecting God to come over to my garden of 60 tomato plants and feed you because you didn't plant yours. Uh -oh. And call it grace. Amen. Hello? Amen. It's called communism. <laughs> You're going to expect God to take mine and give it to you, and you didn't do with it what he told He said, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. Amen. As the Georgia prophet said, nothing from a nothing leaveth nothing. <laughs> Some of y'all remember him. <laughs> He says, some folks send $20, or some folks send $10, or some folks send nothing. As the, as the scripture said, nothing from nothing leaveth nothing. <laughs> I'm not, I think it was the Georgia Prophet Special Edition Bible. <clears throat> so Paul goes to the armor of God, telling us to be equipped and be prepared. And, you know, we, read, you know, we, take the, we took the helmet of salvation and the Word of God, with, or the rhema of God, and, uh, and praying always. Now, let's get in here. Let's get in here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, <clears throat> the prayer and supplication and many times are so closely interchangeable it's hard to distinguish it. But really, if you, if you kind of do a little bit of study, if you study the word prayer, it's prayer. Supplication means prayer, request, entreaty, supplication. In other words, supplication has to do with making requests. Not just, you know, prayer. Prayer is communicating with God. Fellowship with God. Worship is prayer. It's a form of prayer. Amen? So there's different, you know, and really the, Am the Amplified Bible says all manner of prayer. You know, the prayer of agreement. Prayer of binding and loosing. Prayer of faith or the prayer of, uh, of, of believing and receiving. Which is really going to move more into supplication because it's entreaty. It's request. Prayers of intercessions. Prayers of worship, prayers of thanksgiving. So there's all kinds of prayer. Amen? And so Paul says praying always with all manner or, or all kinds of prayer and supplication or entreaty or request in the Spirit and watching there into with all perseverance and with entreaty and request for all the saints. And as for me, so in other words, prayer is to be part of our life. Communing with God. Just like this morning we're singing that, that song. It is getting hot in here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on television. They, they saw my motions. I can't, it's like, okay, they didn't hear me, but they see me going. 
Okay. Where was I? Before I got hot. Yeah. Um, Paul says, as for me. So we got people, we got praying, we're praying, we're communing with God, we're worshiping with God. Yeah, this one we sing that song, I'll return to the heart of worship. That's, that's worship, that's prayer, that's worship. You're worshiping God. It's a form of prayer. It's a manner of prayer. Getting back to the heart of worship. It's not just about a show. It's about worshiping God. Amen. But he says, as for me, or and for me, listen, how, listen to what he requests that they entreat and pray for him about. That utterance may be given unto me. He didn't ask him for this. Did you notice he didn't ask for his needs to be met? Didn't pray for him to have a new Cadillac. Pray for him to have a new Rolex. Pray for him to have, you know, a, a, another jet. Didn't pray for him to have a bigger house. He said, for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. I need you guys to pray for me so I can get the job. I got a job to get done. Yes, it takes money. I understand that. But Paul's heart is, I need the boldest. I'm going to face circumstances, and I'm going to face situations where they're going to try to kill me. This, this man, been, they tried to kill him. Amen. He's going around, they didn't like Paul. They tried to kill him. They stoned him and left him for dead. Which I believe is when he was called up to the third heaven and saw things that were un unlawfully uttered. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, and then God raised him up. Hallelujah. He came back and said, that probably messed him up. I mean, these are professional stoners. They know when somebody's dead and down and out. They know when, they know when to take them down. I'm telling you right now, I mean, they knew how to take people out and justify them. So they enjoyed doing it. Yet Paul got up and walked away from that, came back and preached some more. But he knew, listen, I'm going to tell you something. When you get hit pretty good a couple times, you know, remember he was get constantly being buffeted. Remember that, you know, that was giving him a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Of this he thought, sought the Lord thrice that he might be taken away from him. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient, sufficient for thee. Moreover, therefore, I will rejoice in my infirmities for when I'm weak, then am I strong. And the power of God may rest upon me. And now let me say something here. It was not a disease. The messenger of Satan was buffeting him. He was, being, he was being resisted. He was being contended with. He was being battered. Everywhere he went to preach the gospel, there was a resistance to it. Um, we met with a, a couple yesterday. My, my alma mater high school, Aiden Grifton, played Swain County over at Wake Forest yesterday for the state 1AA championship. And uh, one of Janie's bridesmaids, her, her daughter goes to that school. Her son's graduated from my, the, my alma mater also. And um, they, they went to the game. And so on the way back through, they met with us. We met them at Chick-fil-A. We spent some time with them because we hadn't seen them in 25. Her, we hadn't seen her in 25 years. So it was just, you know, they were, they were excited to get to see each other. And, um, but the, the, they were talking about his, this, her husband went to South, went to a theological seminary down in Florida. <laughs> and uh, his, his roommate in college has been pastoring. And he, and he started sharing some stuff he's been through. I thought, my God, sounds like me. You know, they had church split here, and this group left, and then this one did this, and then, then this, this one got mad because, you know, he, di he didn't do this. Or they had somebody in the church that did this, and they didn't publicly rebuke him and, and, and scold him and strip him down butt naked and tar and feather him. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little excessive here. I mean, you know, and just totally fillet him so that, you know, everybody knew that he was wrong and this kind of stuff. And, and so this one of his biggest givers in his church left over that. And, I mean, this guy just, you know, he went, he went they're still holding on, but, you know, they, they've been through it. Amen? You know, that's buffeting. Yeah, it is. You're being buffeted. What did I do wrong? You ain't doing nothing wrong. The devil's trying to take you out. Right, right. Trying to stop you from doing what God. And Paul, was got, he, Paul had him a little pity party one day. He, thought, he went to the Lord three times to get rid of that. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. Not my divine, unmerited, undeserved favor. My empowerment is sufficient for you to be empowered to take your stand and to win. God never empowers us to lose. Yeah. It doesn't take empowerment to lose. What does it take? Quit. I got to just quit. You lose. If you quit, you lose. No matter what, you lose. You walk off the court in the middle of a the game, they forfeit the game to the other team. You walk off the football field in the middle of the game, they forfeit, you, you forfeit the game. I've seen baseball teams get mad at the calls of the umpires and just pull the whole team off the field. They forfeited the game. It, you can't win if you're not on the field. God does not empower you to lose. He empowers you to win. Amen. 
Amen? Hallelujah. And so Paul had been buffeted. I mean, over and over and over and over and over again. And so he says, pray for me that I will have boldness. That I may, for utterance, that I may speak boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Praise God. After all he'd been through, he's still saying, give me boldness. I mean, empower me to do more. Get more done for the kingdom. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> for which, listen, he says, for which I'm an ambassador. Listen to this. In bonds. He's in jail. He said, make me more bold in jail. Now they arrested, they arrested Phil Driscoll on some kind of semi-trumped up uh, IRS charge. You've got to watch them guys. I, I, I'm so, I'm, one reason I'm for a flat tax, get rid of the IRS. Yeah, thank you. A bunch of thugs. We don't need a bunch of thugs running around making everybody scared that you didn't do the dot your I here or cross your T there and they're going to and find the daylights out of you. And it's all within their power. I'm, I'm just for getting rid of them. Well, Driscoll, they, they did something. And non-profits, they go after non-profits, big ones especially, with a vengeance. They will find something. He went to jail for about, um, about 18 months, 20 months. He had a revival in jail. Yeah, praise God. I mean, he had getting people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, he, he, I mean people were crying when he left. He went down to jail and had a revival. Amen. I'm telling you, listen, folks. You know, Paul, Paul was in jail. He was in bonds. And he, you know, he'd been beaten, all this stuff. And he says, make me bolder. And the reason he was in jail was for preaching. <clears throat> his wasn't an IRS mess. His was for preaching. He said, make me bolder to proclaim the mystery. And I'm an ambassador. I'm in, I may be in chains, but I'm an ambassador. For therein I may boldly speak as I ought to speak. In other words, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to hold back. I want to keep giving everything I got to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then he begins the closing of his letter. We're going we're to wrap it, Paul up here. I got four verses. You think I can get it done? Do you believe I'm going to get it done? <laughs> Where's your faith? We have nothing to base our faith on. Every time you say you're going to finish, you're, you know, all right. <clears throat> but Paul, let's back up here. <laughs> I may have four verses left, but I'm going to back up. <laughs> Praise God. Think of the fact that man is in bonds, he's in chains for the preaching of the gospel. And he writes this letter and then says, now look, pray for me that I'm going to have boldness to make known the mystery of God and to speak it as I ought to speak it. In other words, I don't want to compromise it. We got people compromising just so they can get more people in the church. This man didn't want to compromise. He was in jail for preaching. And he said, don't let me compromise what I believe or what I preach. Even though I'm in jail, I'm an ambassador in here. And I don't want to quit preaching the right thing and saying the right thing. Pray for me that I'll have the boldness to continue to minister the way I minister. And make it known. Oh my God. More churches like that. Not all churches have bowed the knee at the altar of uh, worldly success. Too many have, but not all have. Thank God for those who haven't, and thank God for stirring in those that have. Amen. But he says this, you know, now Paul's going to kind of give them a little comfort. He says, but that you may also know my affairs and how I do. In other words, I know you guys are concerned, want to know how I'm doing. Um, uh, Titius, <laughs> yeah, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for that same purpose, that you might know our affairs and might, he, might bear, and he might comfort your hearts. In other words, I'm sending him to let you know how we're doing, where everything's okay, it's all good, and he's going to relay that and share that with you, you know, because Paul knew their heart, their love for him. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, uh, how, how much we love Dad Hagen. and appreciated Dad Hagen. And, you know, when Dad went home, it was a, it was a hard thing because we loved him so much. I, I felt, you know, uh, similar when Brother Summerall went home. I had a tremendous love and respect for Brother Summerall. He's you know, different ministries and different type of ministries, but I mean, Brother Summerall did a lot for the kingdom of God. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. And uh, Paul wanted their hearts to be comforted, even though they knew he was in jail. He said, hey, amen, look, just keep praying for me that I'm going to be bold because I am about the kingdom. Amen. And then he says this, peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he closes this with one, one, a very interesting phrase. Now let's, let's look back over here in chapter 1, verse 1. 
In verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I get people who jump on following that. See, God speaks His grace over everybody. And Paul closes with this. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. In sincerity, amen. Whoa. Now, he establishes in the beginning God's grace is available. But he tells you it functions. He closes after all this letter of talking about the grace of God, what it's done and what to do. He closes with saying, be unto all those who love him in sincerity. Wow. Yeah. See, you can't, that's why you can't take verse 2 of chapter 1 and run off and start preaching. God's grace is on everybody no matter what they do. When he comes back and finishes the book and says, God's grace be on those who all love him in sincerity. He's laid out his case in the whole six chapters. Amen. He's laid it out in such a way that now we understand Jesus paid a price to receive from heaven a divine empowerment to en enable us to do the things we're supposed to do as believers and to live that life that God's called us to live as believers and to do it in a victorious manner. And then he says this, his last thing he says in this letter is, grace be to all them who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. What does that tell me? It tells me that you can't just go out and live like a dog sinner and expect blessings just to keep running all over top of you. Amen. But if you read the whole book between these two verses, verse 1, verse 1, 2, chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 6, verse 24, in between there is the establishment of the grace of God being available and the grace of God being received and it producing victory. Amen. And this is what God wants us to understand. We said this before. To everything there is a what side? There's a Godward side. What's the Godward side? Grace. To everything there's a manward side. You ready for this word, aren't you? Yeah, go ahead. W-O-R. K-S works. What to do? The manward side is to do what God said do through the empowerment of the Godward side of grace. And this is what Ephesians is really about. It's about establishing a Godward and a manward side to the equation. And that the life of victory is not neither achieved through just doing the manward side or just having the Godward side, but the two coming together. It is God's grace available, man acting in, in response to that grace and doing what God said because of that grace that produces the equation or the, 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 the equal side of victory or the answer or the solution. Thank you. The solution. The solution of victory. See, victory is the solution. But it is the Godward side, the equation is the Godward side plus the manward side equals the solution of victory. Mm -hmm. Amen. How many are here? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're here. Praise God, everybody's here today. I've had people here who, who, who weren't here. How do you know? Because how many are here and they didn't raise their hand? I'm going, where are you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm Facebooking on my, on my iPhone. I'm checking in, telling everybody I'm at Faith and Victory Church. That's a new thing now. You check in where you go. And then you see all your friends around you. You say, I'm at Rhema Bible Church. I, I, how do you know? Because my girls do this. Craig Hagan does this. I mean, people, the dean of the school does it. I mean, you know, you know, you look down there and say, Jessica Taylor is at Rhema Bible Church with so-and-so, and so-and-so, and, so -and, -so, so -and, -so, and five other people. Yeah. We go to a restaurant in Tulsa, Cheddar's. And Jessica Taylor and Shannon Taylor are at Cheddar's with three other people. Edward Taylor, Janie Taylor, and Nathan Taylor. Everybody checks in on Facebook on their, on their iPhones. Hallelujah. So, start checking in. I'm at Faith and Victory Church in Greensboro with Pastor Ed Taylor and, you know, Jeff Gill. And, uh, how, many have, how many have iPhones? How many have Facebook? That, that's how you get it. If you're on Facebook, they can, they can tag your name off of Facebook and put you out there that you're at Faith and Victory Church. Amen. How did I get off on that? Are oh, you here? That's right. That's right. So we're going to start checking Facebook to see if you were here. 
<laughs> Did they check in? Oh, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So, in summation, the God were side of grace plus the man were side. Now, listen, I, I, really doing it is obedience to what the Word says. Amen. You may say you don't have to obey. I don't really, don't really care what you say. What does the Bible say? Obey those with the rule over you. You can say, I don't have to obey all day long, and the Bible says you do. New Testament. New Testament. That is not mixing the old and the new. That's not putting old, new wine into old wineskins. That is a New Testament scripture that says obey those with the rule over you. Amen. I get so tired of these dumb statements that are, that, that are designed to emasculate the believer. What do you mean? By removing from them the very thing that's going to bring them victory. So we think it's all the Godward side, and that's how you're going to get into universalism. Jesus has paid the price. Jesus paid the price for all sin, past, present, and future. We don't have to do anything. It's already been done, and now everybody's saved. Everybody goes to heaven, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're an Islam, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a, a, a you know, um, a Reverend Mooney. Hello? It doesn't matter because you're under grace. But the, see, the equation is the God we're side plus the man we're side equals the life of victory. Your solution of the life of victory is not achieved unless the manward and the God were side are in the equation. So if you leave part of it out, guess what happens? All right, if 5 plus 5 equals 10, so the solution of victory is 10, and the Godward side is five, and the manward side is five, and you go, all right, I've got the Godward side, five, plus I don't have to do anything because I'm under grace, zero, and that don't equal ten. What happens? You get that little slant through your equal mark. It's not equal. Oh, no. It's all about worse, the legalistic side. No God, all man, that's zero plus five equals ten. No, nope. slash. It takes the Godward side, 5, and the manward side, 5, to equal the solution of victory of 10. You have to have both sides. You have to have both aspects in the equation to achieve the solution. Amen. So we, we have to understand that in relation to God, I'm not doing this because I'm a great person and I have great, you know, fortitude and I've got the such and such family constitution and I've just got a lot of willpower and da 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 and I do this and I did that and I'm the best Christian in the church and I give the most and I do the most. No, 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 no. The reason I can do and the reason that I do do the things that I do. Did I use the word do enough? <laughs> I guess you can say if I do the things that I do because I can do it all by myself, then it's just doo-doo. All right. <laughs> oh, that was just weak, wasn't it? Oh, anyway. <clears throat> does, that, does that make the equation? Do you all understand what I'm saying? All right. When we understand that it starts. Remember, Paul didn't start with the works and the do's. He started with what God has done. Right. So it starts in the grace of God, what Jesus has done for us. Amen? It starts there. It starts in the revelation that there is an empowerment that comes out of that grace. Then it goes to what I am supposed to do based on the fact of his empowerment in me to do it. I am not abdicated from doing it. I still have to do what I'm supposed to do. You are too. Amen. Amen. I'm still required to obey. I'm still required to do certain things. There are things the Bible says for me to do. But not in my power. It's, by, it's because his empowerment is there by his grace. And so this book sums up and he says, Grace be unto all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. His grace. Well, if you love him, what did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. You know what Jesus said? I said, isn't that what Jesus said? Well, who's Jesus? Oh, just the head of the church. That's all. Yeah, but brother so-and-so from such and such country got on the cover of Charisma and on the TBN network, and he said such and such. I don't care who got on what and did what. Yeah, right. What did Jesus say? 
And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here he says, grace is on all those that love him. Well, how do you demonstrate you love him? You keep his commandments. <laughs> you do what he said do. Amen. Remember when he's talking to Peter? He says, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord. And then, he, and then he came back and finally said that. And Peter got kind of uptight about this. Said, what about him? John. He's, just, he's over there. He's laying on Jesus' chest. You know. I mean, you probably think some people call him a suck up. He's over there laying on Jesus' breast. Ah, who, do, who does he think he is? You know, I mean, jealousy on the ministry team. I mean, because Jesus laid out for Peter, you might have to die for me. What about him? <laughs> yeah. Jesus said, what is it to you if I have him live until I come back? You do what I told you to do. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. You do what I said do. It doesn't matter what he does. You do what I said do. And in the whole thing of him obeying and doing what he said do, he kept asking him, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? I submit to you in the light of all the stupid stuff that's being said today by people who wouldn't know their head from a hole in the ground if you took a picture of it and showed it to them. That the demonstration of your love for God is to do what he said. And doing what he said is not sitting around looking at the finished work of Jesus. We look at the finished work of Jesus to empower us to do what he said. Some people go, all we, all we do is look at, look at the finished work of Jesus. I just sit. That ain't going to save anybody. Amen. That's not going to get you out preaching on the streets. Yeah. That's going to have you laying hands on the sick. No, looking at the finished work, and I'm not mocking the finished work of Jesus. I am mocking the statements that people made that make it say something that the Bible doesn't say about it. Yeah. Looking at the finished work of Jesus empowers you to go walk worthy of the vocation, to submit, to obey, to do. Amen? Amen. And this is how we are to live our life. Loving the Lord by doing what he said do. Not depending on our efforts, but the, but the grace of God that empowers us to live this way. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this teaching on the book of Ephesians. Lord, I had no idea when I started this that instead of the three weeks I thought, the three months it took. But you know what you're doing. And we thank you for your grace that's been upon us to minister. Thank you for the anointing to the ears of the hearers. Thank you for biblical truth that protects our hearts from winds of doctrine that, that drive us to and fro. Thank you that we're established in the truth and live in the truth and do the truth and walk in the results and the life of the truth in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We want to ask this question this morning. If you're here today and Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, would you please raise your hand? We want to pray with you. I always want to make sure that people are, are going to heaven. Hallelujah. How can you make sure they're going to heaven? Get them saved. How do you get them saved? They confess Jesus is Lord, believe in the heart God's raised from the dead, and you'll be saved. Amen. You're here today and you're backslid. Now, I mean, backslid is what, just what it, we call it in the Bible. Backslid. What does that mean? You went backwards. You stopped living for God and started living according to your flesh, living according to, you know, how life was, how your friends were, but you weren't living for God. You know, God said he'll heal your backsliding. He took the prodigal son and put him right back into his established state as, as, one of, as his son. He didn't cast him aside. If you're here this morning, you're back, so you want to be, get right with God this morning, raise your hand. One more offer. You're here this morning. You're born again, love God, walking in all the light, you know how to walk, but you're not yet filled with the Holy Ghost. What do you mean by that? Well, exactly. Acts 2 4 says they were all filled with the Spirit of God and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you're here this morning, you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, we want to pray with you. We'll lay hands on you, get you filled with the Holy Ghost, and you'll go your way speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. Amen. Anybody here? I'll tell you, I remember the first time Gina, Gina Curry came here. She liked to jump over the front row when I said that. <laughs> 
the way they responded to the whole service, I thought, man, these, these, are, new, these are Christians that have been to a word church their whole life. They're filled with the Holy Ghost, love the Lord. When she raised her hand, it was like to shock me. <laughs> so you just never know. You can't, you can't assume people are walking in all, the, all places. All right, look up at me. You can stand up now. Uh, don't forget tonight... Um, we're having our communion and healing rally. What's that mean? Well, if you know sick people, uh, invite them to come out. We're going to teach on healing. We're going to lay hands on the sick. Um, if you know people that, that can't get here, bring a prayer cloth. We'll pray over it. You can send it to them. I'm going to tell you something. We've had miracles. Mm -hmm. We've had miracles sending prayer cloths. I mean, we're talking about people who aren't really, don't believe like we believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello? People who believe like we believe. Sinners. We've had, I mean, notable miracles with prayer cloths. So why do you do it? Because we get notable miracles. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. There's been more notable miracles in, in my ministry from prayer cloths than there have been by directly laying hands on people. By far. It's a tremendous number. And I'm talking stuff that just, you know, there's no, there's no weirdness. I mean, it's just flat out. There's a miracle. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So, you know, bring them. We'll, we'll, we'll have them up here. We'll pray over them. Praise God. No sick people that are close by. Get them to come in. It's always good to sit under the Word. 